I want to have a few words to say closing out on 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 that we began a study of last Sunday morning. But I would like for us then to be moving over into the second Corinthian epistle, and we will note that in just a moment. First few remarks will be a bit repetitive to bring us up to where we were. We mentioned that Paul is answering questions that the Corinthians put to him, and he introduces each question by saying, now concerning, and so he does it here in the beginning of what we have is chapter 16. And it concerns collection for the saints. We emphasized last week that everything about Jesus and his earthly ministry, the apostles, and then when the church is established, involve giving. And that if you remove giving from Christianity, you destroy it. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Blessed to receive, yes, but it's more blessing to give than to receive. And thus, we are giving people. This has to do with the collection for the saints. He says, I have given order. It's not a matter whether you want to or not. If you're going to be faithful to the Lord, you will obey this apostolic order. He says, I gave that order that I'm giving you first to the Galatians. And he says, you do what I told them to do. Upon the first day of the week, I mentioned last week in the Greek text, it's the first day of every week. But I also mentioned that even when it doesn't say every in the English translation, we know it means every first day of the week because there's a first day of the week in every week. Thus, whenever that first day of the week rolls around, all other things being scripturally equal and we're gathered together in the worship assembly, then we're to contribute of our means on the first day of every week. But the point now that I want to make and give emphasis to, I did touch on last week, let every one of you. Now, if there's a uh, two income or two people having income for the family, both are Christians, Everyone means not just the head of the house, the husband, but also the wife if she's working. Or if the children are working and they're Christians, they too ought to be giving. Let every one of you. If I were to say, let every one of you take your songbooks. Let every one of you eat. Sometimes we'll do it this way, like on Thanksgiving dinner, several people there will have the prayer and say, now let's eat. Or we'll say, let's dig in. And that means every single solitary one of you at this table eat. We know that. It's no problem. do do a Greek exegetical study here to get that. Let each one of you, every one of you, lay by him in store. And I wanted to look at that just for a moment. It's a personal responsibility as a Christian. When Paul says here to let every one of you lay by him in store, literally it means by itself. It would be good to think since the word saint means one sanctified, and sanctified means set apart for a certain thing, that during the week as you purpose what you're going to contribute on the first day of the week which is an individual personal responsibility you set that aside for Sunday think of it that way set that aside for Sunday's contribution lay by him in store by itself you put something aside each Sunday this involves your own judgment you must sit down and consider in the light of what the Bible teaches should concern all of us about all spiritual things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Thus we give 
as we've prospered. We don't do it grudgingly. Well, I have to, so I'll give something. We do it cheerfully. And we give proportionately on the basis of a first things first principle that should guide us in all that we do. Now, are we flawless in that? Oh, we may not be from time to time, but it doesn't rule out the teaching of the Bible on what we ought to be, what we must be, and what God expects us to be. And it's the individual matter. So this is to do with the proper thinking of a person relative to how they determine what they give. That's very important. Now, the Greek term... Thesarezum, rendered in store, conveys the idea to put into the treasury. McGarvey in his commentary just brings that clearly out. It has to do with since the church was expected to assemble on every first day of the week to worship God, that this would be done at that time. Now, does it rule out your individual opportunities, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, to do good as you have the opportunity? No. Galatians 6.10 authorizes us to give even when we have opportunity on Monday or whatever. Here's what Galatians 6.10 does not authorize. Taking your contribution and cutting it to be able to give during the week. When you give something individually because you're a Christian based upon Galatians 6.10, the opportunity to do good, then you're giving beyond what you set aside normally to give. A lot of people never think about that. On the first day of every week, let each of you lay somewhat by itself. That's one way that that reads. McKnight does that in his old work as he translates it, lay, you lay somewhat by itself according as he may have prospered, putting it into the treasury that when I come there may be no collections. There's been a big to-do in the church split over this many, many years ago. It still exists to this day. It says you cannot help those who are not Christians out of the church treasury. That individual Christians can help people who are not members of the church, but you can't take it out of the church treasury. I've just never figured that one out from the time I was a teenager and first heard about it. In fact, I had a couple of brethren come over to the house, Daddy and me, to teach, me, teach us on that. And I didn't know anywhere to begin to know what I know now. But as soon as I heard that, I thought, the individual Christian sets by during the week according as you've been prospered, to give on the first day of the week, and every individual Christian does it, it goes into the church treasury and immediately can't be used for what you're giving it for. Why? Because it's collected. Now that just doesn't click with me because first of all, Paul says, I want you to do that so I won't have to run around to your house and gather all this up when I get there. It'll be waiting on me when I get there. That's the whole purpose that will be waiting on me when I get there. And if you go back even within Jesus' group of apostles during the Lord's earthly ministry, the principle, underscore that word, of a treasury as an orderly means of handling finances is recognized. So you have full authority to give each one of us on the first day of the week as we've been prospered, glad to do it. We're cheerful to have a part of the work and we make provision for it in the week preceding the next first day of the week. Now what if I run across something individually once I put that aside to give on the first day of the week? Take care of that also. Can you imagine the good Samaritan traveling down the road, sees this Jew over here naked, beaten, left for dead, the whole people wouldn't even pay attention to him. And he sees him, and he says, well, I gave on the first day of the week. I don't, I don't have to help him. That may have been the way that the priest and the Levi who walked by on the other side of the road thought, because I know that's the way that a lot of those Jews did think. So what are we thinking? It makes a lot of difference what we're thinking, doesn't it? 
And the word of God rightly divided must be what we're allowing to guide us in our thinking. It's fallacious to suggest that Paul was merely urging his brethren to save something at home. It goes against the very idea that when I come, I, won't, I don't want to have to go around to all your houses and collect all this for the poor saints. It will already be there in the treasury. So this would have defeated the apostles' explicit stated purpose of not being forced to contact each Christian individually when he came. Now notice he is to give each Christian, each one of us, let me emphasize that, each one of us is to give as he may prosper or according to his ability, Acts eleven, twenty nine. This is what we would simply call proportional, proportional giving. Now this is going to lead us on over into the second Corinthian epistle. I mentioned last week, and I've mentioned it other times, but specifically in this study of what does 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 teach, of what's found in the second letter Paul wrote to the Corinthians concerning giving. Because he does authorize us, even when it comes to giving on the first of the week, to give beyond what we normally would and he makes that clear as he is exhorting the Corinthians to follow through with the promise they made one year before this letter was sent to them to give. I want to begin in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. So what's he doing? So I want you to consider the churches of Macedonia. Macedonia was a poor region. It had been suffering all sorts of earthquakes and all kinds of wars up in that area. They were a desolate group in comparison to other places around about them completely opposite from the city of Corinth down south there in Achaia. They were a very prosperous city. The people there were much better off than the people of Macedonia. That meant brethren in Macedonia did not have what the Corinthians had as a rule. Now he says, I want you to think about them because how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy. Now think about that. A great trial. They're being afflicted. They're being hurt. And yet, this produced abundance of their joy. It's amazing how different people look at what's going on with them in life. And I mean Christians. I mean members of the church. The saints of God. Have you ever noticed how Paul would take things that came upon him as persecution because he loved the truth, preached it, defended it, and lived it. And yet he would say, this, this I'm undergoing for the cause of Christ. This is, this is what I'm doing is filling up where Christ left off. It's all a part of being a Christian. It's part of setting a godly example. It's part of doing his work. So their abundance made itself known the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded into the riches of their liberality. Those words don't really fit. Their deep poverty abounded, abounded under the riches of their liberality. How is it that that could be? And remember who he's writing to and their economic status. And he said, now here's the example I want you to look to. And then he tells us what governs all of us as to why we're what we are in the church. For to their power, I bear record. Now, when he says I bear record, I witnessed it. I saw it with my own eyes. I experienced it. Yea, yes. And beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. The last part there. They were willing of themselves. 
I wish we would realize that we are what we are because we want to be. Think about that for a minute. I am what I am in service to God because I want to be that. I excel in those things that are spiritual attributes of the kingdom of heaven because I will myself to be. I want to be. Well, that's why they were able to give more than Paul thought they could give and rightly that they were expected to give because they were willing of themselves. Thus, they gave beyond what they normally would be expected to give. And evidently, Paul, I get the picture here behind the scenes saying, Brethren, you all don't have to do that much. I know the position that's putting you in because I see in verse 4 that the Macedonians, he says, praying us with much entreaty. Much entreaty. Entreating them, saying, no, we want you to take it. Have you ever been in that position? Where somebody is giving you something for something else, and you know that they could use it themselves. That they need it. But, they're giving it. No, that's that's too much. That's too much. But you see, no, no, we we want to. We've been there. We know what those brethren are undergoing down in Judea. We understand what it is to have wars rage around us and to be starving and our economy collapsed and our houses destroyed from earthquakes and battles everywhere. We want to. We know what we've experienced. What they're going through. Praying us with much entreaty, not little entreaty, but much entreaty. You say, well, how much is much? And I can answer it again. Uh, it's more than little. But entreaty means they're, they're virtually begging him to take what they have. And Paul knows it's far more than they should give. But he also knows it's because they gave themselves totally to God that they do this that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry of the saints. Now, here's that word fellowship. We've been spending a lot of time on that word fellowship in various sermons and on Wednesday night in our studies. We want to be partners with this work. These are people who've been through what we've been through. We know firsthand what they're undergoing, the need for something to eat, clothing to put on, houses to live in and we want to have a part of this we don't normally think of fellowship in this way but God does this is fellowship that's more important than a whole lot of other things that might fall under the heading of fellowship because it's truly helping people who can't help themselves and it's the ministry to the saints Paul would say at times, let brotherly love continue. You see it right here. This is what's meant by brotherly love. It's not running up and hugging somebody and saying, how are you doing? That's all right if that's what you want to do. That's okay. He said salute one another with a holy kiss. And that didn't mean the Hollywood smooch. It meant simply their custom was simply touching the cheek on each side. And they still do it in a lot of countries. If you, want to, if you want to see how they still do it in a lot of countries, uh, again, you, you've got YouTube at your disposal, and we watch every other thing in the world on it. Might as well watch something that cues you in on how other people live. And I noticed in the eastern countries, I knew they did it anyway, but it's interesting how they greet one another every time. And I've seen them do it over and over again. They kiss on each cheek, and they reach down and kiss the hand. That was a normal greeting. And Paul is saying his brothers and sisters of the family of God, salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. In other words, it was genuine, heartfelt, warm, we would say it, firm, handshake, like a minute. And so this is part of that ministering to the saints, that fellowship, that sharing, and even doing more than Paul expected. And notice, and this they did. 
Uh, the this they did is added, but it's the way we would say it to translate the Greek, and this they did. Not as we hoped, that means expected. They went beyond what was expected. It's amazing. Sometimes you expect out of people what you think they would give since they're Christians. I'm talking about and about anything, their time, their work, their talents. And you don't get that. You get less than you expected. But these folks gave more than the peerless Apostle Paul expected. And he emphasizes it again. He did it up earlier where he says they were willing of themselves. And now he does it again in verse 5. First gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. They gave themselves to the Lord and they gave themselves to this and participated in this fellowship, in this work, by the will of God. Well, this all went as it did to the point to where we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. <clears throat> Again, he talks about the giving is grace, favor. This gives you a chance to favor the poor saints down in Jerusalem and in Judea. Again, we don't see courage used that way most of the time. We think of it used when it comes to God extending salvation to us through Christ when we don't deserve it. But here he's talking about the actual work in the church of brethren, loving brethren, and being mindful of their needs and going beyond what they're normally expected to do to supply those needs. So, to finish in you the grace of God, left a man in Corinth, such as Titus, to see that they do what they knew they ought to do and the year before they had promised to do. Therefore, therefore meaning in the light of everything I've just written, here's the conclusion. As ye abound in everything, obviously the Corinthian church did a lot of things. In faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us. You can't neglect this one. See that you abound in this grace, this favor also. And he could just as well have said, remember the example of the Macedonians that I've given you. You know their state of affairs, and you know your state of affairs. Notice he says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Now, he's not saying I said all of this, but you don't have to do it. He means I could just command you by apostolic authority. But I won't. I'm going to let you make up your own mind. Just look at your brethren in Macedonia. And what does that tell you that you should do in view of the need and that it was one year ago you promised to do what they've already done? So for ye know the grace, notice now he still used that word grace. He moves from humanity in the church and its obligations to Jesus himself. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich. I've thought about that a lot of times concerning the matter, he was rich. What's he referring to? The position in glory that he had as God before he ever became a human on this earth to save your worthless necks when by justice you actually ought to have been condemned to hell. So he's saying, are you the spiritual body of Christ? Are you members in particular? Do you wear the name Christ, which means of Christ? Are you to be busy about doing his will? Yes. And you know, it's not something they don't know. They're not ignorant of it. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Now why did he do that? So our Lord, the second person of the Godhead, gave up the form of deity, Paul tells us in Philippians, took upon himself the form 
of humanity, became a man, became flesh, John 1, 14, and came into this world to save us so he could be tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin, go to the cross and die on our behalf so our sins could be remitted by his body offered as a sacrifice for sin, knew no sin, and his blood shed for the remission of sins. He lowered himself to that kind of thing. That one word rich describes eternity. It's, it's amazing how God does things like that. Describes the position of Jesus when he was still the word, the second person of the Godhead. With the glory as he prayed himself in John 17 that he had with the Father before the world was. He gave all that up. Didn't hesitate. Good thing to do, right thing to do, and he did it. Now, how is he applying this right here? Well, I've given you the example of your brethren in Macedonia who don't have anywhere near what you've got. They've suffered all sorts of things you've never suffered. And they gave more than I expected them to give. And they did it because they're dedicated Christians. They've given their lives to God. So they begged us to take this contribution with much entreaty. Now, what should you learn from that? But now, if that doesn't impress you, your own Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he impoverished himself to save your souls. Does that make any difference to anybody? And herein I give my advice, for well, this is expedient for you, what he's about to say to them. It's advantageous for your spirituality, your growth and development, your being faithful. We have begun before not only to do, but also to, to be forward a year ago. He doesn't mind saying you, you've had plenty of time. Even as travel was in that day much slower, you've had plenty of time to do what you said you would do. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. That there was a ready, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. Then he drops back to what he said about the Macedonian brethren. For if there be first a willing mind, it's accepted according to that a man hath. And not according to that he hath not. Now sometimes I don't think we realize what he's saying. You give according to what you have. And likely whatever the Corinthians would give would be in proportion much more than what the Macedonians could give. But what the Macedonians could give, they went beyond that. Now what will you do in view of the fact that you have so much more and you've been so involved in so many good things. Will you let this slip? It's been a year. What are you going to do about it? Notice, for I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. What is he saying? When everybody gives as they've been prospered, when everybody gives cheerfully without grudging, when everybody examines themselves according to the income and however their prosperity is uh, accomplished, then altogether there's no lacking. Some may give more, some may give less. But they're going to give if they give correctly because they're totally given to God. That's what the Macedonians did. And Jesus saved you because he emptied himself and came and lived as a man, tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin, humbled himself to the death on the cross. And thus he is your example. Now Peter would say this concerning Christ being an example in suffering persecution. He's left us an example that we should walk in his steps. That principle is the same for everything. And it's the same when it comes to brotherly love. And it's the same when those brothers are helping other brothers who can't help themselves. I've been in a few places in the world where they couldn't give very much. 
And I know also from visiting with others to where some people just did not have what we would say cash. They didn't have a bank account. They couldn't write a check. <coughs> so they would actually bring from their farms what they had. Might be a goat. Might be two goats. It might be two or three bushel baskets of rice, something like that. And they would take it on the first day of the week, and then they would, of course, sell it, turn it into cash, and the church use it what it could. We have to get into our minds that we cannot be compared to the Macedonians in America, not economically. We must be compared properly and accurately to the Corinthians. We just don't realize how much we have of this world's good. How much we can do. We get so used to living on the plane that our economy allows us to live on. And we don't realize that some people income for a whole year doesn't amount to what we get in a week or two, if that much. And yet they still give. God didn't say, you're a poor folk. You're born in a country where you have nothing but a mud hut. You still give. Take giving out of Christianity and you destroy it. So but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want and their abundance also may be a supply for your want that there may be equality. As it is written, he that hath gathered much had nothing over and he that gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. I've left Titus there, what? To see that you follow through in participating in this work. I remember you promised to do it a year ago. Now do it. For indeed, he accepted the exhortation. But being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. Do you realize Paul saying, I'm sending Titus there? as a preacher, to get you to give? Think about that. wonder what Titus said when he got there. <laughs> I wonder what he said to those brethren. Because look what Paul said that he sent him there for. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not that only, but who was chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace. Every time he talks about the contribution of the poor saints, he calls it a favor. This favor you're doing for other people, your brethren, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind. Ready mind. You're ready to do it. You want to do it. You're anxious to do it. You're glad the opportunities come along. It's part of your showing your brotherly love. It's part an integral part of fellowship between the brethren. There's another point that we don't see sometimes here. Macedonia and Corinth were Gentile churches. He's, give, he's asking them to give to Jewish churches. There was always, and you read through the New Testament, you see this, there was always on Paul's mind to keep that middle wall of partition that the law of Moses had erected between Jew and Gentile broken down. It's taken out of the way in Christ. He was always doing things to get Jew and Gentile together. That was a big problem in those days. The Jews had 1,500 years of saying, we don't have anything to do with you Gentiles. And the Gentiles pretty much said, if that's the way you feel about it, suits us fine. Only a few would really proselytize to the Jews compared to all the other Gentiles that didn't. And so they had built up walls between themselves. God didn't intend for the Jews to mix with the Gentiles. He intended for them to remain separate because from them the Messiah would come and it was a way of preserving the Jews till they would get here. That is, he would get here. So there's likely, and no doubt in the mind of Paul, this is a good way for us to have the oneness and the unity and the brotherhood that ought to exist in the church where there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ. And if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3. Now, that's what he's got in mind. It's a right thing to do for anybody to help those who can't help themselves. 
That's not the point. The point is there's far more to this than simply feeding the poor. It shows your love for your Jewish brethren, and it will cause them to think a great deal of difference toward you. And I'm interested in the oneness of the body of Christ as it's expected to be. So avoiding this, verse 20, that no man should blame us in the abundance which is administered by us. That tells us that these people traveling with Paul were selected to the churches because the churches knew them and nobody could say this money's being used for bad causes. You got witnesses there. That's a good bit of advice for everything the church does when it comes to money. Witnesses to be there. It's not because that these people are dishonest. But it means that this keeps everybody from being able to charge them and prove their case that they use that money wrongly. And so people, of course, would be those that were trusted by the churches that were sent with Paul as this whole group journeyed to Jerusalem to take the collection, providing for honest things not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. That's what he said he was doing. He also says that back over Romans 12, 17. It's an integral part of Christian living to make sure that we show forth to everybody we're open and above board. You ever hear people say that? We preach the gospel, we're open and above board. Today they say transparency. Well, we are. What have we got to hide? We're going to answer questions. I've said that many times we're open and above board. When I had a radio program years ago, I had said that on every, every program. We're open to the board, and then I would say this. We welcome your investigation of the Church of Christ, a lot of what the Bible teaches. Send us your questions. We'll do our best to give you a Bible answer. And that's where it ought to be. Paul's doing that right here regarding this favor, this grace that came by the terrible famine down there in Jerusalem and Judea. So what do we see? We make plans during the week, each one of us who are Christians, according to the income that comes in, to set aside part as we prospered, keeping in mind the principles that guide all of us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things should be added unto you. We set it apart to contribute as an act of worship in the worship assembly of the saints on every first day of the week, and each one of us will do that. We don't just grab a quarter and drop it in or happen to get a hold of a dollar and drop it in. Uh, or like one fellow said one time I saw on television, he was warning, didn't want to give the $100 bill he had in his pocket, so he took change out of the, out of the plate as it went by. Well, that's all right, but uh, that's kind of strange. The point is, we give as we've been prospered cheerfully without grudging because this is a part of fellowship and a part of worship, and it comes through our whole week preceding the first day of the week to think about what we have come in and what we have been given and the great blessings of our Lord Jesus Christ who became poor for our sakes to save us. Now in time, I'm going to probably move this discussion over to Sunday afternoon. I'll try to do that next week. Because I want us to begin to apply a little more of this. And I'm going to tell you as a sneak preview how we're going to do it. This is the season of giving. But I wonder if people ever say that. And say, he's talking about the church. This is the season when you're going to put stuff on your charge card. You normally wouldn't. And I read a thing not long ago. It said people are still paying for last year's Christmas what they put on their charge card then. This is a time when you'll have the opportunity to say, I can do something beyond what I normally do. Oh, no, I can't do that. In the next month, you're going to spend more money than you normally do. Now, if you say, I won't, I expect you to repent of that and respond to the invitation, and I'm not joking, because you will. It may not be much, but you'll do your best for grandkids and kids. I've heard people say sometimes, I just want 
So and so to make sure he or she has a present too. Well, I'm, we're, we're giving more than we normally give. You give in buying all these presents. How do you expect us to do that? I don't expect you personally to do that. But we have one who's told us that he expects it. And he said it this way. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Now take that. And take what we've studied from the sacred volume, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, and 2 Corinthians. And see what that does for you. You're a child of God. You've got a Bible. It's in your Bible before I ever preached it. It's there for your information, your guidance. But like I said, that's just a teaser. Lord willing, time goes on. We'll say more about this next week, <coughs> Sunday afternoon. But now I close the lesson saying, have you given yourself to the Lord? If you're still in your trespasses and sins and separated from Him, you're lost. You can't go to heaven because you're separated from Him. You must believe that Christ, the Son of God, was such an active, obedient belief that you repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and you're baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Then you rise to that water of your grave of baptism, having given your whole to God. And in the church, you serve Him faithfully. A part of it is giving. An integral, fundamental, basic part of it is giving. If you're a child of God, and you violated anything pertaining to faithful Christian living, you need to repent of it and pray God for forgiveness. If you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.